All right. So thanks very much, Sean, and uh, for organizing this and for the invitation. Thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, it's always a pleasure for me to be back at uh, SDG. So yeah, um, today I want to talk about recent joint work with Anthony Quas on Lyapunov exponents for transfer operator uh, co-cycles for one-dimensional maps. So feel free to ask any questions as we go along. I may be slow with the um, chat, but um, feel free to interrupt me. And so let me just uh, start by saying a few words about the general context and motivation for this work. We'll be talking about compositions of uh, discrete time maps, T omega. Uh, D in this case will be the interval or the circle. And the way in which we choose the map that we compose at each step depends on the state of a system which is external to what we're observing in the interval. So completely independent, independent evolution of what we observe. And this is what we call the driving system, sigma. And um, because what we're uh, interested, so one of the big motivations for this uh, project comes uh, from the fact that we would like to get some insight, some ideas on how to analyze much more complicated systems. So even say uh, geophysical flows or ocean dynamics, something we will not get to at all today, but um, we keep this in the back of our mind. So we try to keep the restrictions on this driving minimal. And for example, we would like to be able to allow uh, say seasonal forcing or uh, noise. And so the conditions we impose are uh, invertibility measure preserving and ergodicity only. So for example, no mixing uh, assumptions there. And so that allows us to handle quite general examples. So we get back the autonomous case. So if we have a one point space omega that uh, we recover the case of uh, one map being applied over and over, um, despite the name random dynamical systems, we can also handle uh, deterministic forcing. So for example, quasi-periodic forcing and also noise. So for example, IID noise at each step. So all of these fit uh, within this framework. So yeah, that's the context. That's what we're going to have in the back of our minds throughout the talk, that driving system sigma. And depending on the state of, uh, of this system, we will be applying the map T omega. And because we want to understand this, what happens in the long term uh, from a probabilistic point of view, uh, we will be working with the transfer operator. So transfer operator tells us how uh, ensembles of trajectories or um, densities evolve over time. And I should say there are more general uh, transfer operators and uh, Jason Atni talked about this a few weeks ago uh, here, but this is the type of transfer operator that we'll be considering here. And in um, several cases, we can show that this is a bounded linear operator of uh, Banach space. And so we're uh, interested in using uh, linearity, of course, but uh, it's not, as simple as just looking at the spectrum, because in this case, we are composing different operators at each step, right? Depending on the state of our driving system, we'll be composing the different uh, transfer operators accordingly. So that's what uh, forms the random dynamical system or the co-cycle. And uh, we don't have, as I said, um, spectral theory right away, but there is something that gets quite close to that, and that's uh, multiplicative ergodic theory. And the way uh, we think about this is it gives a spectral type decomposition, which uh, allows us to split this uh, space of densities into uh, time varying modes, which are ordered by decay rate. So just to make the comparison a little bit clearer with the autonomous case. So in the autonomous situation, we have a single operator, which uh, if we have good um, properties, for example, quasi-compactness 
it gives us some uh, isolated eigenvalues and finite dimensional eigenspaces associated to, to them uh, that are responsible for the, uh, say, dominant components of the uh, dynamics. In the non-autonomous situation, there's a similar concept of quasi-compactness. And when that holds, we have multiplicative ergodic theory giving us Lyapunov exponents, which are something like logarithms of these eigenvalues, which are growth rates, and uh, oscillated spaces, which are uh, the generalization of eigenspaces, but there's some differences. And uh, one of them is that they depend on omega. So they are changing with time, but they're um, equivariant. So uh, we'll see an example in a little bit. So these are modes that change over time. And uh, the other difference is that we only have information about the uh, exponential rate of growth or decay. We don't have uh, information about what happens in one step. So let me actually uh, spend some time giving you uh, what I think is one of the simplest examples uh, about this. And this is uh, for two by two systems. So the linear space would be just R2, right? Um, and the autonomous situation here corresponds to having a two by two matrix. So let's say this uh, stochastic matrix here. And of course the uh, leading eigenvalue is one and the leading eigenvector here is E1. And uh, the way to understand the long-term behavior in this system, so here we have time in the horizontal axis and um, P1, the probability of a particle uh, being, say, on uh, state one. So if we start with two uh, different particles, blue and red, in the opposite, in the different states, and we evolve them uh, forward with the dynamics, quite quickly after maybe five or 10 steps, they become uh, indistinguishable from the point of view of statistics. And, and what we're seeing here is, of course, the stationary distribution. And this um, is the first entry of E1.16 uh, uh, six something. OK, so that's the simple case. In the case of uh, forcing, so first let's do some periodic forcing. Here I took uh, period 12. I think this could be like having a different matrix being applied each month to the dynamics. And if we start with different um, particles in different states after, again, a short period, they become uh, synchronized. We can uh, not tell them apart from the uh, probabilistic point of view. And um, But the actual behavior is much more complex. So it's no longer just uh, constant. It has these ups and downs. So what we're seeing here would be like the first entry of this uh, oscillated vector. And of course, in general forcing, we don't have periodicity. We may have some noise on top of that, for example, and uh, we'll be seeing some, something quite similar. So what we're plotting here after these particles have synchronized, you can think of as, say, the first component of that uh, top oscillated space. OK, so going back to um, the transfer operator and infinite dimensional uh, setting, well, we will have um, possibly um, countably many Lyapunov exponents. And these are like the logarithms of the real polycot resonances. Uh, the oscillated spaces yj, so there's one of these finite dimensional spaces associated to each of the Lyapunov exponents. But we can have a complement to that space because, yeah, we are generally in an infinite dimensional space. But what's important is that vectors in this complement uh, decay faster than uh, vectors in our oscillated space. So they're re less relevant for the long-term dynamics. So we call the Lyapunov spectrum sigma. We just um, take the Lyapunov exponents and put them with repetition. If, um, if um, for example, lambda one has multiplicity two, we repeat it twice. And um, we'll just uh, going back uh, to the example and more generally putting this in context. So the first oscillated space encodes uh, equilibria for the system. So it's uh, time dependent, but it still tells us about the statistical behavior of the system in the long term. Um, U2 tells us about uh, rate of correlation decay or speed at which these 
um, convergence happens to this um, equilibrium. And Y2, Y3, et cetera, are slowly mixing modes or also called coherent structures. They uh, were studied in the context of interval maps by uh, Buzi and Kiefer and uh, several other people, but this was uh, not yet in this context of uh, multiplicative ergodic theory, but in that context, it was al already um, known that, for example, there's this equilibrium and this uh, kind of relaxation, rate of relaxation. So for multiplicative ergodic theorems, uh, let me say just a few words about the history. They started with Osoledets in the 60s and Raghunathan who worked for uh, invertible matrices. And um, later on, Ruel, Magné, uh, Tulenlian, and Lou Blumenthal, they worked on different generalizations to uh, infinite dimensional spaces trying to cover different uh, application problems. Uh, but in the case of transfer operators, uh, these are not invertible operators uh, very often. And so that's why semi-invertible multiplicative ergodic theory was developed initially by Freuland, Lloyd, and Quas. And um, later I uh, also joined that uh, effort. And I think by now the results, the uh, abstract results are quite satisfactory from the point of view of uh, transfer operators. Um, and what uh, we were quite interested in was to try and see if we could uh, understand in more detail some examples and compute some of these quantities and these properties. So that's what I'm going to tell you about uh, in this uh, talk. So first, uh, random metastable maps. So let me say a few words about metastability. This comes up in uh, physics and chemistry, and it's usually associated with a picture like this, like an energy, uh, potential energy. And this state here, one, which is a stable fixed point uh, for the system, is called uh, metastable because it's uh, stable, but it's not the state of least energy. So if there's a little bit of um, forcing in the system, this um, state can change and uh, go, for example, to state three. And these are um, associated with uh, phase transitions and atomic molecular dynamics. So I recently uh, became aware that uh, there's a metastable state of oxygen, which is responsible for the green color here in these northern lights. And uh, in molecules, there are uh, molecules uh, which uh, spend a long time in a certain uh, configuration, and then there's something, uh, perhaps a little bit of uh, noise or other energy that comes in the system and they change their shape. So those are just a couple examples of uh, say classical or somewhat classical um, um, uses of metastability. So in math, we think of metastable systems as systems where there are multiple uh, time scales and these were studied in probability so here I'm just listing uh, some uh, of the important names. Uh, people use large deviation theor theory and also um, spectral theory for self-adjoint operators to investigate these systems. And in dynamics, uh, we think of this uh, metastability also as systems with multiple nearly invariant components. So for us, uh, equilibrium may be as stable fixed point, but it may also be, for example, an absolutely continuous invariant measure or something more uh, complicated. So that's why we have this, uh, this point of view as well. And this is just a picture of a metastable map. So if a particle starts on, say, this middle interval, it may spend a lot of time bouncing around until this, it leaks through these little holes to the right or left interval, and then maybe spends a long time there again before coming back. So this would be the metastable or nearly invariant components. And if we look at the transfer operator for these maps, their spectrum could look something like this. So one is always there and there may be uh, values which are near unit eigenvalues. They could be complex, so, um, so that can happen. But 
Um, these were uh, studied by applied mathematicians in Germany, Delnitz, Junge, Duffelhardt, Schutte, and collaborators, including uh, Gary Freuland. And um, from a theoretical perspective, Keller and Liberani developed um, important um, result um, linking this, uh, this metastability with near unit eigenvalues. And since then, several people, uh, including myself, have been interested in understanding these systems. But in the case of random uh, maps, the way we think about it is uh, having a second Lyapunov exponent, which is near, but not equal to zero. So that's what we say about uh, metastability. And let me again give you a simple example with two state Markov chains. So here we have left and right states and some uh, leaking from epsilon one from left to right, epsilon two from right to left. And in that case, um, the two by two matrix is, um, of course, this uh, A omega. The leading Lyapunov exponent is zero and something um, not usual, but um, in this case, possible is to write down a formula for the second Lyapunov exponent. So in general, this is very complicated even estimating, but in these two by two examples, we can write down exactly what this is just by looking at the determinant. And so if epsilon one and epsilon two are non-zero, but close to zero, this number will be uh, just below zero. So that's going to be a metastable system. And of course it corresponds to having the system spending long times on each of the uh, states before moving on and spending long times in, in the other state. So the model I want to tell you about is called pertent maps and it was uh, studied by Horan in his uh, thesis. So this is a system which has two parameters. So A and B tell us about the height of these tents. And um, the way to compose these random maps is, well, now A and B are functions that depend on omega. And um, on top of that, we have a scaling parameter epsilon that makes these uh, heights go to zero as epsilon goes to zero. Of course, for epsilon equals zero, we have two invariant components and uh, the system is uh, not metastable anymore. There are two um, mutually singular uh, ergodic components uh, here. So the result that Horn uh, sh showed in his uh, thesis was an upper bound on the second Lyapunov exponent, which is of order epsilon. And he had some ideas and some bounds on what this constant C is. And furthermore, he was also able to find a lower bounds also of order epsilon in specific examples of uh, pertent maps. So, um, Cecilia, sorry, sorry. how does the yeah, A and the B, um, I, I see the red on the picture, but <clears throat> how do they relate to the maps? Right, so, um, I mean, to the mass? Oh, I get it, uh, the, the A, that's the peak of the right-hand one. Okay, I was looking in the wrong place. <clears throat> yes, so, so, so B here it. is this height, <laughs> and A or minus A here is this height, right? Oh, okay, thanks, thanks. Is, is, does a, is a C a function of A and B? C? Yes. Uh, C? Uh, yes. Yeah. So um, in Horan's uh, result, I, I cannot tell you exactly what this is, but it does depend on A and, a and B. Um, but in the statement that we give, the dependence is very explicit. So, um, so uh, in we looked at uh, this exact um, same family of maps with a different perspective, and um, so here we call L epsilon the uh, transfer operator for this uh, tenth map T omega epsilon. And the result we show is that, well, the first Lyapunov exponent is always zero. So that's not uh, really that 
uh, new, but the second Lyapunov exponent, so that, that's uh, the main uh, result here, is of order epsilon, so it's minus epsilon, and then uh, there's this dependence on A and B. So it's uh, the integral of A plus B, and then there's a correction of order epsilon squared log one on epsilon. So, uh, well, uh, in this result, we also show these are multiplicity one exponents and also an upper bound for any remaining uh, Lyapunov spectrum uh, of order. So it's minus log two plus a little bit. So very far from the top two um, exponents. And before telling you more about how we showed that uh, result, uh, let me uh, connect back to this two by two state Markov chain, because uh, here, I mean, one could make a very coarse partition of the system into left and right components and see what, how much mass leaks from left to right and how much mass comes back. And well, what's that um, Lyapunov exponent, okay? Um, so I should say, this is an example of an ULAM partition, but it's a very coarse one, right? In general, we are, uh, for the ULAM method, we partition into many beans and uh, construct uh, matrices of larger and larger dimensions and try to understand the uh, dynamics from that point of view. And actually one of the big questions that we have in, in uh, the program is to know when this ULAM method gives the right uh, approximation, say for Lyapunov exponents and uh, oscillated spaces. But here it's a very, very simple uh, two state uh, or two beam partition. So in that case, we write down the uh, Lyapunov exponents as we computed earlier. And it's just an application of Taylor theory, theorem to show that the second Lyapunov exponent actually coincides up to this uh, error term epsilon squared log one on epsilon with uh, the, the true Lyapunov exponent. So that's a really good news from the point of view of uh, having good behavior of um, Lyapunov exponents with respect to uh, discretizations. We'll see in the second part of the talk that that's not always the, the case, but it's uh, very good news uh, in this situation. So now let me say a little bit about how we go about, how we uh, show this result. And uh, for that, we looked at these uh, pieces that we call the holes, which are the, um, parts of the phase space, so the uh, initial conditions for which uh, we have leaking to the other component in one step. So there's hole on the left, hole on the right, and the overall hole is just the union. And we'll be looking at small values of epsilon, and uh, we'll also be talking about this number k, which is roughly like log one on epsilon, and is telling us about the time that trajectory spent on each component uh, before coming back or before going back through the hole. So um, the, the way in which um, uh, we thought about this problem was, uh, and this is what, what we call the quarantine approach, was to break down the densities into K plus one components. So, uh, we think here F0 as the main component of the density, and then the others are kind of uh, in quarantine. And the whole density is just the sum, okay? So we're just breaking it down for bookkeeping. But uh, the way to evolve it is, well, we take this main component and we take the part that doesn't go through the hole, the part that remains in the same component and push that forward with the transfer operator. And the part that goes through the hole that uh, goes to the first quarantine stage. And whatever was in the first stage goes to the second stage and so on, okay? So, and the last bit um, comes back to the main component. So it really is like a quarantine uh, process. So it comes back to the main uh, component after these uh, K, K plus one steps. Sorry, Cecilia, what, what were the little F noughts to FK? So these are just going to be our uh, density. So we, instead of thinking of a density as just a function f, we think of a density as k plus one um, part. So it, you can think, for example, that 
to start with, we have F and zeros, but um, it's any, um, okay, so, so maybe this can be uh, clearer uh, later. So actually what will be um, the part, the type of densities we'll be focusing on are densities for which this first component kind of dominates all the other ones. So the L1 norm has to be bigger uh, in different uh, senses uh, than the L1 norms and the variations of the other components, okay? So uh, as I said, we can start with uh, F and zero, zero, zero. And uh, the idea would be that, um, well, uh, first of all, that this set is invariant. So if we start with a large um, first component uh, in the sense that it dominates all the others, this will be kept uh, throughout. So for example, there's no mass leaking all of a sudden uh, you know, all the mass uh, is going through the hole or something like that, okay? What, what is a var zero complement? Okay, so yeah, that uh, is just um, a way to, that we uh, look at the variation of the uh, function. And what we mean by that is just, we look at the variation of the function on the interval, but we disregard any jumps at zero. So yeah, that, that's a little bit uh, of a technical, um, I mean, it comes in the technical uh, part, but it, we can define the uh, BV norm as the variation away from zero plus say the L1 norm or something like that. So, so again, I, I don't quite understand this F node to FK. So is it like, so your partition is like the pre-images or of your of your holes, and okay. then you support this. The FJ is just the, the I, I don't quite sorry I don't understand what the F F yeah. what this notation is. Okay, so so let me uh, try again. So um, let's say initially we will start with a density, and we want to know what happens as we push forward. So the uh, this would be uh, in in this space we could encode it as just you know f and then zero 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 okay so initially uh, we have uh, our main our density that's our main component but uh, what happens after one step in the evolution is uh, we will be keeping a part of the image uh, in the first component but there will be another part which we will be sending to this second, um, to this uh, kind of separate place. And the only goal of this is to help us in the bookkeeping, right? Because this is, we're just uh, splitting the density and sending it uh, somewhere else. But when we collect this back together, so the sum after applying this operator is just the push forward of the original density, right? So in the end, we are not really interested in these pieces, but this is just a um, tool for us to uh, be able to control, uh, to estimate what is going on. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so, um, so yeah, H how do we compute the Lyapunov exponents? there. So let me not say much about the first exponent as that's quite uh, standard to show it zero. And for the second exponent, what we look at is the amount of mass that remains, for example, on the left or on the right interval. So that's what we're going to call phi plus and minus. That's going to be the total mass set on left and right intervals. And uh, there's this uh, simple relation that says, well, the mass for example, on the right interval will be after push forward, whatever it was before, minus what went through the hole plus what came through the hole. So there's that mass preservation uh, property. And in, the, in this uh, case of uh, pertinent maps, well, and also for functions in this um, space where 
uh, in this invariant space C, we can actually relate these um, integrals to the, uh, say, measures of the whole. So in this case, the Lebesgue measure of the holes is like epsilon times A and epsilon times B up to epsilon squared errors. And um, the integrals can be um, approximated. So the epsilon term is um, this one, depending on A and B. And there's an epsilon squared log one on epsilon correction times the uh, L1 norm of the initial uh, of the dominant of F0. And so if we start with a function of integral zero that is preserved under the transfer operator, and so this relation becomes a multiplicative um, a relation for the integrals. So we have the integral after push forward, say on the right is whatever it was before times this one minus epsilon a plus b plus the correction. And so that uh, is an estimate that of course we can iterate and that's how we get the upper bound for the second Lyapunov exponent. So um, we can use birkhoff ergodic theorem to essentially give us this upper bound on the decay rate of the uh, functions with integral zero. And it gives us this, um, precisely this number, minus epsilon times the integral a plus b plus epsilon squared log one on epsilon correction. Now, uh, to get the uh, lower bound, in this case, what we can do is we can find a specific function, the sine function, so plus one on the right, minus one on the left, that uh, for which we can uh, control this leaking of uh, mass, say from the right interval, exactly by these products. So we get the lower bound here, uh, matching the upper bound before. So that's uh, by working with a specific uh, function. And uh, for the rest of the spectrum, what um, we do here is we find a function that is related to the uh, evolution. So, sorry, yes. Cecilia, what, what, why, why when you use a specific function, you get a lower bound? Um, sorry. Um, it's, so for the lower bound, so if we have a function of integral zero and we uh, have a, say lower bound on its growth rate, it's just in the, it, by the same reason that if we find any function that grows at uh, a given rate, that will be a lower bound for the first exponent because the first exponent is like the largest of all possible growth rates. Uh, for the second exponent, we know that if we restrict to integral zero, um, we are projecting out the coordinate, say, in the first component, right? So any function there, um, if, if we find a growth rate there, uh, that will be a lower bound because there could be larger growth, but that for that particular function, we get the growth rate lambda two. So if you compare to what you did on the previous slide, because it looked kind of similar to me, mm -hmm. um, so, right. So in the previous slide, um, what we showed is that for any function of integral zero, the growth rate will be at most this, right? So that's an upper bound because for every function there, uh, the, the growth rate is bounded above by this uh, quantity. Uh, and um, in the other case, we are uh, taking a specific function and um, we are computing the growth rate, well, up to this error, right? But we are computing the growth rate. Um, so, and it, and it is given by the same, by the same quantity, right? So 
yeah, may, maybe, yeah, we can follow up or we can follow up later, but this is not something uh, very deep. Okay, thanks. So um, for the other exponents, what we do is we find um, functional that, um, well, when we have an initial function with integral zero and functional zero, then we can bound the growth rate, uh, find an upper bound for the growth rate, which is minus log two plus a little bit. So essentially that says that, you know, in any three dimensional space, we will always have a function that grows uh, at most at this rate minus log two plus a bit. And so that's exactly giving us an upper bound for the say third exponent or uh, any remaining exponents. And this is also giving us um, the fact that lambda one and lambda two have multiplicity one. So that pretty much uh, finishes that uh, part of the, of the argument. And uh, yeah, to finish this um, section, I just want to connect back to multiplicative ergodic theory and um, connect back, uh, well, one of the big reasons is because this work uh, will appear in the volume uh, celebrating Professor Oseledet's 80th birthday. And um, so how do we connect back? So what I've said so far, we've been working trajectory by trajectory, so omega by omega. And uh, um, it's not so easy to just put things back in this general framework because bounded variation functions usually are um, yeah, difficult to, to deal with uh, from the point of view of measurability. So the way to go around it here is to put everything in a different function space, for example, fractional Sobolev space. And so it's a somewhat general result that gives us that the uh, top two Lyapunov exponents will be the same. Uh, we pay a little bit of a price here on the third exponent, but it's still a similar type of bound. So minus log two plus a fixed amount. And what we gain is that we get measurability of uh, these top um, oscillated vectors, uh, for example, when seen as functions in a one and also of the multipliers. So uh, that's the end of this uh, part. Uh, I realize it's getting a little bit late, so I don't know uh, how much longer do we want to go and uh, or maybe or perhaps we should uh, stop around here and take more questions about that first part. I'm happy to go on. Okay. Yeah, it's up to you. Okay, so maybe um, Let's just uh, try to do this a little bit uh, quicker, unless there are some more questions. What? Um, okay. So the second part is about uh, still one-dimensional maps. These are analytic maps. And um, this will be about finding the Lyapunov uh, spectrum. So in the previous case, we talked about two Lyapunov exponents or three Lyapunov exponents. And here we'll talk about the full spectrum. This is a family which is called finite Blaschke products, which are defined as functions of uh, the complex variable Z in this way it depends, the uh, Blaschke product depends on this number zeta, which is a unit complex number and the zeros are these AJs. There's quite a bit of, uh, nice properties that this Blaschke product satisfies, including this uh, commutation with inversion. And they're also, so these were studied uh, by a number of people, including Martin and Tichler and uh, Bantlow, Just and Slipanchuk more recently in the context of transfer operators of uh, autonomous maps. So there's, um, explicit conditions that say these 
maps are expanding on the unit circle. By the way, these maps leave invariant the unit circle, uh, the unit disk, and these are also, of course, um, um, rational functions in the Riemann sphere. So we can be thinking of uh, them in different ways. Uh, we will think of them mostly as maps of the unit circle, but we'll see that the unit disk also becomes relevant uh, shortly. And um, when these maps are expanding, that's a condition, explicit condition on the coefficients, uh, there are these uh, numbers capital R and little r so that the disk, this blue disk of radius capital R gets mapped strictly inside of a smaller disk. So um, similar, similarly something happens with uh, the exterior uh, disk uh, circle of radius one on R. And so that gives good properties for the transfer operator when uh, applied to analytic functions on this annulus. And I should say, Bantlow, Just, and Slipanchuk use this uh, framework to investigate and find the spectrum of uh, transfer operators for Blaschke products, so for single Blaschke products. What we do here is we compose uh, randomly these different Blaschke products. So we change the uh, AJs, the Zetas, and um, we only ask that they have a common um, annulus there. And uh, we look at the peron frobenius operator associated to these uh, Blaschke products on this um, Hilbert space. Um, and well, the first observation here is that there's a random fixed point for these maps. So that means there's um, a family of points x omega that gets, ma gets mapped its equivariance of e omega x omega is x sigma omega. And this is an attracting fixed point in the sense that uh, pullback attractor. So any um, if we start with a disk of uh, slightly smaller than one uh, radius, we push it forward, we'll be converging to these uh, random fixed points. And with that, we can define this number lambda, which is the average log of the expansion um, at that fixed point. And it's actually this number, uh, which incorporates information about what's going on inside this disk that tells us about the spectrum of the, the uh, transfer operator. So this lambda is always negative. It can be minus infinity. And so when it's minus infinity, we will get that the Lyapunov spectrum is uh, trivial in that it will have a zero as the leading Lyapunov exponent and everything else will de decay super exponentially fast. And when this is a finite number, the spectrum will consist of multiples of this number. And we can also characterize oscillated spaces. So we can uh, somewhat surprisingly write down explicit formulas for the first component of the space. Um, um, these are related to uh, Poisson kernels in potential theory. And second and higher uh, spaces, uh, so the exponents, uh, apart from zero, they have multiplicity two. And um, each of these spaces is spanned by two vectors one which has a pole of order j plus one at um, x omega and the other one pole of order uh, j plus one at uh, one on x omega bar. So we can get some uh, good information about that. Let me skip this technical slide and just tell you about some applications and some examples that we can um, construct with this information. So um, first phase transition, uh, so here, let's assume we are driving, our driving system is a Bernoulli process, so probability of zero is P, probability of one is one minus P, and we compose either the doubling map if we have a zero or this other degree to map if we have a one. Uh, and um, we look at the Lyapunov spectrum of the cocycle and we end up having this phase transition at a half. So for P less than a half, 
we have a full Lyapunov uh, spectrum. So this number lambda is finite. And as soon as the doubling map is at least a half, um, has at least a half probability of occurring, then we have uh, collapse. So we have this trivial spectrum. And let me skip these few words about. Uh, so let me just say that uh, to show that uh, we only have to pay attention to, um, you know, try to approximate this, the location of this random fixed point. Um, but once we have enough information about that, it's um, somewhat direct computations. So let me now talk about collapse. So if we have one of these random Blaschke products, and on top of that, we have some noise, for example, normal, um, annealed normal noise, we can uh, show that for P at least a quarter, we will have uh, this uh, trivial spectrum. So there's a range between a quarter and a half where the uh, initial uh, system without noise will have a complete spectrum. So we'll have a collection, infinitely many Lyapunov exponents. And as soon as the noise is turned on, we will have a trivial spectrum. So this is an example of instability of Lyapunov spectrum. Of course, there's a famous work by Boki and Viana showing that Lyapunov exponents are unstable. But um, I think, yeah, this is the first time we, we see this in the context of transfer operators. And actually what was uh, surprising to us was to see this instability happening for uh, somewhat natural example. So, um, so generally, uh, it's hard to to find, or it's believed to be hard uh, to find um, these instabilities. So, that was somewhat surprising. Uh, but in this context, we were able to actually characterize uh, the full uh, stability uh, properties. So, uh, it ends up depending on whether or not this uh, quantity, the derivative at the random fixed point remains away from zero or not. So when, so if these uh, derivatives remain bounded away from zero, then we have a stability property. Namely, if we have small perturbations of the Blaschke products or, or of the transfer operators, then as the perturbations go to zero, we get convergence of the Lyapunov exponents. And if these quantities are getting arbitrarily close to zero, then uh, we have instability in that we are able to find a family, even within the Blaschke product uh, class, where the Lyapunov spectrum of the perturbation, arbitrarily small perturbation, is um, trivial. So that's um, the um, dichotomy. And just uh, to give an idea of uh, how general stabilities or instabilities are, so we get this result that stability is generic. So if we give a distance between random Blaschke products, say by taking the maximum distance between their images on the unit disk, then uh, we get the, that the state, the class of stable uh, Blaschke products, so those which satisfy the stability conditions of the theory, theorem, are uh, form an open and dense subset. So, of course, that's uh, good news from the point of view of uh, expecting to have stability much more generally than instability, at least in this case. So, I think. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave this, I'll leave up this uh, summary, but I'll stop here and I'm happy to take any further questions. <laughs>